Welcome to Cars on Call. I'm automotive journalist and gastroenterologist Steve Schutz. I guess I don't really need to mention uh, gastroenterologist, but uh... not unless somebody <laughs> wants a colonoscopy. <laughs> you never and know. You never know. <laughs> <laughs> trauma surgeon Stefan Moran. We are the only podcast that has an actual trauma surgeon who's operated on patients after car accidents, car crashes. Sorry, and uh, uh, seen. You've seen it all, Stefan, but also done research on, uh, on car safety. So uh, he's here uh, as always. And then Adams Hudson, our, he's like a car expert. Uh, we know cars pretty well, Stefan, but not as well as Adams. Car collector, enthusiast, uh, consultant. And I'm up quite often on this show, but <laughs> not as much as me. But um, we here's what we're going to talk about. We're going to talk about. Uh, a little bit about car sales because 2023 is over and the car sales have been reported and they're interesting. And then we're going to talk about trauma surgeon safety. Again, Stefan's going to do that as always. And then uh, we have an interesting car spotting that leads to a little bit more discussion. Hashtag Aston Martin. And then uh, finally, uh, no, not finally. Then we're going to talk about if you're 45 years old or so, uh, that's kind of when you're really in your professional, not peak, but you're really, you know, you're going to be successful. You know it. And that's where you start buying nice cars right around then. You paid off your debts, blah, blah, blah. We're going to talk about what's the car that 45-year-olds now are looking to buy, uh, in our opinion. But we're also going to look back because this changes. It's, it wasn't the same car 50 years, 40 years ago, 30 years ago. So we're going to talk about the past. And then we're going to make predictions about what we think will be a cool uh, car for someone who's successful. And I think this matters just because uh, it trickles down. You know, the, the car that really successful people buy today is something that more average people will buy 10, 15, 20 years down the road. Uh, and then we've got a car collector thing where we we now have a lot of money. We have $200,000 to spend on a collector car. We each pick yeah, one. Right. We don't know what, which, we don't know which one the other person is going to do. So um, without further ado, let me get into the, the, the 2023 car sales. And this is pickup trucks. And if you don't have a pickup truck, don't worry about it. Pickup trucks matter because they are by far the best selling vehicles. One, two, three is uh, is pickup trucks in the United States. It's not true worldwide, but it's true here. And uh, the king is the F-150, the F-Series. And there's a picture of an F-150 and the F-Series uh, includes the heavier duty pickups. But just for perspective, Camry... Uh, they sold about almost 300,000 Camrys last year. The RAV4, they sold about 400,000 RAV4s. The Explorer, about 200,000. So you're talking between two and two and 400,000 sales for the best-selling vehicles uh, on the road that are not pickup trucks. F-Series, 745,000 uh, models. You know, it's like almost double the the, the best selling in what we would call regular car, which is the Rav Four. It's up fourteen percent compared to two thousand twenty two. Silverado and Sierra were both up. The Silverado five hundred thirty seven thousand, so about two hundred behind the F one fifty, and the Sierra uh, is two hundred ninety two thousand. Both those are up. So if you add up Silverado and Sierra, you end up with more actual GM pickup trucks full-size pickup truck sales than the F-150 or the F-Series. Ram was like on the march at one point, this is probably two years ago, they outsold Chevy, and now they are dropping fast. And I don't really know why. It's not like they're that much, it's not like they're not as good, uh, but they're down 5%, down to 443,000. Again, the Silverado was 537,000. So I don't want to belabor this, but... I do think this is going to come to an end. These are full-size pickup trucks that nobody really needs. Stefan, you pointed that out, this out. You can do fine with a Ranger. I think you can do fine with a Maverick or, a, you know, the, the the Colorado is the GM version. So I can't imagine these full-size pickups for non-work use are going to continue to sell this well, but they're selling a lot now. Gas prices go up. That's all it's going to take. But I know it's crazy that there's so many of these trucks on the road that are just daily drivers. But, um, you know, I think if we, you know, another OPEC crisis, you know, some of us are old enough to remember that. Um, people will start parking these things back like when they did in 2008 as well. 
you know, it was a, it was a, it was an OPEC, it was an 08, it was a 2015, you know, there's several, uh, you know, little blip in gas prices and that's all it kind of takes. And, you know, once, once I, I feel like when, when OPEC now, of course, being, uh, you know, d dismantled, when they started seeing the EVs coming on strong, I think they started cutting prices and or cutting production to raise prices. And they play that little elastic game with the prices. But I agree with you, Steph. That's all it would take. But, you know, Steve, I wonder, and I'm not asking you to look it up, but, you know, when you hear about, you know, 700,000 uh, F-150s and a cumulative uh, 800,000 more GM, and then you you add in the Rams, that's 2 million vehicles, brand new, the all trucks. They all fit kind of the same profile. Yes, I know there's differences of, you know, everybody's got their flavor of, the, of, of their choice. What are they trading in on these things? Are they trading truck to truck? 70% of the time, 80% of the time, because if not, that tilt is just going to become bigger. And I think one day people are just going to get sick of seeing them, get sick of parking them, get sick of putting fuel in them. I feel like, you know, I'm not saying the end is near, but I sure do portend a change in that. It's just too much similarity and they are grossly overweight, grossly oversized and grossly underused for what they do. I, you know, I cringe when I see the commercials of some guy, oh, it's a 10,000 pound towing capacity going up a hill. Nobody does that. There is, uh, and Stefan owns one, so we'll get him to chime in here, but there is a large group of guys, and this is mostly men, that buy or lease and get a new one every two or three years. Small business owners, they want to be seen in a Mercedes or something fancy, so they drive this course if you're going to a job site a builder uh, any kind of contractor they're going to need them and again they don't want it just for work use they use it to to tow the boat on the weekends and towing a boat is a is an important thing or going to home depot and you know a lot of, there's a lot of small business men uh that are out there that they get a new one every two or three years and that's a lot of them and i think i don't know what the number is but i would say easily the majority my guess would be 75 percent uh, of trucks that get get sold an, an old truck is is traded in that's that's my guess let me just say this and i'll throw this out there and we got to move on but i'll throw this out there i drive i've driven many many vehicles as a car reviewer and there is no vehicle that is better on the highway than a full-size pickup they have a great ride they're very comfortable my wife, Elisa, has commented on this, like, oh, my gosh, like last time I had an F-150, which was about a year ago. She's like, this is the greatest truck on, on the road. I, the, the ride is incredible. So they they fit into your life because when you're on the highway, you can see around everybody. You're not hemmed in. And then when you're in town, you can see above everybody. Now, people can't see above you, but that's their problem. And it's very comfortable. And as long as, uh, as, long as the gas is affordable, I think that's kind of what it is. Uh, don't you think, Stefan, since you own one? Absolutely. I mean, it, they're, they're incredibly comfortable. I love my truck, but I mean, driving that thing in the city, trying to park, pulling into parking decks, parking lots, it's just, it's an ass pain to drive in those areas. And um, that's why my bullet's got 35,000 miles on it. Cause if the weather is nice, I'm taking the bullet. I'm not taking the truck. Um, when you like driving, you know, there's one other thing and we will move on. Um, I know Steve is chomping at the bit with a little safety section coming up too, but the, um, there's a tax law uh, in effect that yes. if, it, if it weighs over 6,000 GBR, I believe, gross vehicle rating, That's right. yep. uh, that you can write it off as a commercial vehicle. And you let that one change because it was written for a different purpose than people are doing it. To right. be fair, you, you could only write off your business use. In other words, you can only the percentage of the price of the truck it, that you can write off is the percentage that you use it for business. And you have to... You have to have proof and that kind of thing. So you go to the IRS and say, listen, I bought this truck for $100,000, which is what they cost now. And 35% of the time I use it for, for business. You can write off the 35000 of the 100 Doesn't hurt. No, it makes it cheaper. It's like a you know, $17,000 17, discount. Yeah. That, that's a good point, Adams. A lot of business people do write off a portion or in some cases, all of it. So... All right, safety from our trauma surgeon, Stefan. What do you got? You had uh, winter tires last time, which was great. I hope everyone who's driving in the winter takes that uh, your recommendation. Well, we're going to stay on the tire theme. Um, so I've got a '99 Miata that 
I think I've driven twice this year because I when I put in the first, I had to replace the clutch cylinder. And I didn't like the way the clutch felt, so I didn't drive it. And then I knew the tires rolled. So I went ahead and ordered a new clutch slave cylinder. I put the car up on four jack stands, changed out the clutch cylinder, said, I'm going to look at these tires. I knew they're old, but I didn't. I, I thought maybe I bought them Don't in 05, 04. On what? Don't you mean tars? Tars, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. <laughs> yeah. Getting all so, died. You know, and we're always on beat on we're always on bring a trailer looking at cars, and there's always somebody, some smart ass always, you know, thinks he's doing the world a great service. And I guess he kind of does. What's the could you please show a picture of the date code on those tires? I'm, I mean, it's like there's these people, but anyway. So I looked at mine, and so if you look at your tire above the rim, there'll be a, a long string. It starts with DOT, Department of Transportation. There's a long string of numbers. And what you want to look at is the last four numbers. So on my Miata, it was 1105. So that means my tires were made in the 11th week of March, 2005. <laughs> Pretty old tire. Oh, oh yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> and then, and then that remind you know, so, um, so we're talking about tire safety. So I pulled off four rims, wheels off the car, and now I'm trying to find a replacement tire. But, you know, some of us are old enough to remember back in 1990s, uh, Ford came out with the generation one Explorer. Mm -hmm. This is the first generation Explorer. And as they, they built off the Ranger platform and they're pre-testing. They had some rollover issues with it. So they had three things they could do. One was change is lower the pressure in the tires, two lower the springs. And the third thing they could do is make it wider. Well, they said we're not going to make it wider. It's going to cost too much. So we're just going to lower this, put lower springs in it, and we're going to recommend a tire pressure, a lower tire pressure. Uh, so they went from 35 to 26. Well, the Firestone agreed to this and actually gave a warranty on the tires. Well, people started dying. And overall, what happened was the, the tread would completely separate from the tire. Kind of like in NASCAR, you ever see where you just get this rubber band peels off the car and mm -hmm. they keep going because they've got a liner. But that's what was happening in these Bridgestones. And they found it was happening at when people were going fast because the faster you go, Firestone. The hotter your tire gets, Firestone, sorry, the faster you go, the hotter your tire gets, especially with a lower pressure. That's why trucks run higher pressures. They don't get as hot. And then in hot countries as well, like out in Arizona and states and then in Saudi. And about overall, 238 people died, about 5,000 injury. And initially, what's really bad is lawyers and traffic safety researchers didn't decide they didn't want to contact NHTSA. The National Highway Traffic Safety Administration, because they they didn't have confidence the agency would do anything about it, and they would they said, well, NITS will just conclude there's no defects, so they said we're going to take this to the courts and sell this in the courts. Led to a congressional inquiry, which led to the Tread Act in two, October 2000. Anyway, so a lot of people died, and it wasn't necessary. And Ford did change it in the generation in the Gen Two Explorer. They made them wider. So a lot of deaths did occur because of tires. So it's important, you know, and you need to replace your tires at least every six to 10 years. 10 years is pushing it. Think about routine tire maintenance. Now we all fortunately have TPMS, tire, tire pressure monitoring system in our newer cars. And if like my truck, what it does is it senses a one of the tires is not turning at the same speed as the other. So it just tells you that you have a low tire. It doesn't tell you which one. Whereas my bullet Mustang, my wife's car actually tells you the pressure inside of the tire, which is very good. And it's important because we get these rapid changes in temperature like we had in Alabama. We went from 70 degrees to 7 degrees. That markedly affects your tire pressures. Um, if you're still not sold on checking your tire pressure, think about this. Only 19% of consumers properly inflate their tires. Mm -hmm. Well, you're that's costing you a lot of money. So that's four out of five people are wasting money because of underinflated tires proper inflation of your tires can save you as much as 11 cents per gallon on fuel um, so it can actually it's a money saving thing to do it it's a safety thing check the tread depth you know a little bar or penny and that reminds me of another story so i went to get you know i'm all over the tires on my bullet i drive that thing kind of hard kind of fast at times in proper places not not in neighborhoods around schools and i go to get the oil changed on it and the guy goes you need new tires um we can set you up i'm like i don't need new tires because yeah, you do. You need to look at your tires. Well, the tires are so wide. I was looking at the outside of the tire. I did not crawl on the ground and look at the inside. 
because of the camber and the caster on the Mustangs, they wear out the inner, the inner sidewall of the tire. And I turned the t wheel, I, I got out, turned the wheel all the way to the right. And I had just gotten back from visiting Jack Roush in Michigan. I had cord exposed on wow. the inner side of the tire. Uh, yes. That's I amazing. It was that much difference outside to inside. And <laughs> folks, yes. what he's talking about, if you can see my hands is the camber, you know, this is, this is zero camber and this is a positive camber. And that's what you had at the top. Uh, that's unbelievable that it didn't look worn at the outside. Outside, the outside looked perfectly fine. It had lots of tread on the outside. So, um, so when you look at your tires, look at you know, look at look at the whole tire, not me, just looking at the outside. Rotate them every six thousand degrees. And the other thing is, you need if you do have a performance vehicle, you may have what are called summer tires or performance tires. Very important to understand that that it's a different rubber that is designed to provide more grip on the track, more grip on the road, more grip, more grip for driving hard. But when it gets below 44 degrees, that rubber turns to plastic. Basically mm. I came out of mine. I drove my Mustang one time. I left it was about 32 degrees. I came on air, but I didn't get on it. And I, that rear end came around fast. I, I caught it. Didn't go off the road. So if you do have a high performance car and you know, it's like, you got it, beautiful day in december and your car has been parked and it's gorgeous outside a blue sky they haven't put salt on it but it's 20 degrees and you got high performance tires on it don't go out there so um, think about what you have on your car um, save some money be safe and check your tires good advice stefan when you were talking about the the explorer and i may have missed it if you said it forgive me but when you when when ford said lower the tire pressure and they had dropped the car down a little bit on its platform was it because there was so much um, rotational resistance heat building up against the tread that caused it to separate? Right. So what happened was they, the, in pre-testing, the thing was rolling over. I mean, the, the explorer ro ro rolling I over. I vaguely so remember seeing that on the news. Right. It made big news for a while. So there's three ways to fix a car that rolls over easy. One is you can lower the car, lower the center of gravity. You can lower the tire pressure, which gives you a wider tire. Or you can widen the axles like they did on the Wrangler Jeep versus the original CJ. Well, Ford decided to do the first two, just lower the tire pressure and lower the springs to lower the car. And Firestone agreed to it, but no one really thought about the heat buildup. And heat so buildup because was. of the lower, the okay. lower tire pressure caused heat buildup. Okay. Okay. Um, and then which called tread, tread separation. It was on that AT tire that Firestone had. So oh, it also yeah. had to do with kind of the design of the tire. Yeah. Um, so and Firestone, Bridgestone, Brid, Bridgestone, and Firestone are the same. I mean, Bridgestone bought Firestone back sometime in 1990 or something. But they they try to keep their brands separate. But you know, there's a whole lot of pirated engineering going on. So probably right. Basically yeah, the same. About that. Well, as we all know, and we've talked about this, uh, the movie star Paul Walker. Uh, died because of bad tires. His friend bought a brand new Carrera, not a brand new, he bought a new to him Carrera GT, which uh, would have been, you know, a five or six or seven year old car and uh, did not have new tires. And the guy uh, just decided he was going to go super fast and there was very little grip and he lost it because of no grip. And uh, they both died in a very fiery crash. So, Tire safety is so critical. So thank you, Stefan. I appreciate that. And All one right. last thing. Let me say, yeah. if you do own an EV, you're going to wear out your tires 25% faster than because of the weight of the car. So they weigh so much. So if you do do an EV, you need to be even more cognizant and check your tires that they're going to wear faster than you would expect them to. Yeah, that's a really good point. All right. I spotted a car and uh, this is this is an interesting brand that, that uh, Adams and I talked about this and Adams is going to go through the history a little bit. But you spot this is all a, the cool cars. Yeah, this is in Sun Valley. It was an Aston Martin DBX. Uh, this is a red one. The one I saw was a really beautiful uh, dark blue. And this is a big vehicle. It's about the size of a Porsche Cayenne. It's on a bespoke platform that they made just for this thing. And it's huge. And uh a couple of things about it. I think it's a very nice car. Uh, I've never driven one, but it looks beautiful. But if you look at you know, what they go for uh, on the secondary market, this is like the depreciation king. They go for 250 ish And uh, uh, I saw one recently. It was two years old. It went for like 
$90,000, $100,000 depreciation king. And uh, kind of a shame, Adams, because what a great brand. It is a great brand. And actually, I think that's a very handsome car. And I'm just looking at the that one line, the LEDs that go around and up and over that sort of cam tail. We'll see a car in their history where that was probably borrowed or at least first started. It's a great looking car. And I like it. I'm sorry to say I, I'm so focused on cars of the past. What motor does that car run, Steve-O? Do we know? Yeah, it's a Mercedes-Benz uh, four liter twin turbo. Basically the same engine you're going to find the GLS AMG 63 and the same engine you're going to find in the S63 AMG Mercedes. So it's just a Mercedes engine, Mercedes transmission. Uh, even the, the the user interface and the tech, it's all Mercedes. Well, that that kind of, it, it's a bargain then. You know, if it, if, it, if it was all Aston stuff, which people are a little bit scared of some of the Aston stuff, the V12s, the 4.3s, the 4.8s that they have and the, like the, the V8 Vantages and the vanquish those can be spooky to maintain but with the mercedes drivetrain i would be less spooked so that may be a bargain but yeah aston has a a, a glorious history and for some reason we've sort of gotten into this um this english brand retrospective that we've been looking at cars that have had glorious histories that have sort of come come into their own and then maybe a little bit on the on the fade not suggesting that aston martin is but there they are copying some of the leaders with their SUV, but you know they were started back in the the 19-teens. Um, there he is. Uh, that that's a gentleman, um, Lionel Martin, racing up Aston Hill. Now you know where they got their name. Mm. Uh, he had a partner in the day who actually uh, left in about 1920, but he was just a fan, like a lot of these guys in the early industrial era. He just liked going fast. He liked tinkering, liked playing with cars. And he had the company for a while. And Aston has a checkered past, if any company does. A lot of these specialty manufacturers do or did. Uh, in 1947, a, a tractor manufacturer named David Brown took over. And it's interesting that also Lamborghini was started by a tractor manufacturer. They just made so much money, fascinated with mechanical bits. Uh, so David Brown gets into Aston Martin, and he starts naming his cars and his engines using his initials, DB. So all uh -huh. the DB references are David Brown. He um, In this era, we got the, the, the incredible cars, the DB4, the DB5, the DB6. And I think, Steph, you've got, a, you've got an, an image of the, uh, there you go, the most famous Bond car ever. I believe that would be called Ascot Fawn might have been the original name of that color, but that's um, the the car that kind of landed Aston Martin is somewhat of a household name. And just for and the every audience, little boy what, wanted one. Yeah, what year uh, is that? That would be. Uh, I think they probably. I think they came out in '63. That one's a '65, and it's just that's a two place car with the inline twin cam six. Beautiful. It had Three side draft Webers. I'm gonna, somebody's going to correct me. I think they're 38 millimeters somewhere in that zone. Very similar to a Jaguar layout, except this was a straight. Uh, this is going to be four liters as opposed to Jaguar 4.2 at the time. And I think the next picture will show that cam tail on a DB6. If you follow that rear trunk line, as the first time in production a cam tail was used. Cam as in not the overhead cam, but K A M M the physicist who came up with that. And that's a, a basically it's a four place DB5, uh, but with the cam tail in the back seat. And it's just really super cool looking. And I think the next one may show the motor. No, it does not. It shows Stefan's favorite car in the entire world, the estate, uh, the shooting brake of the DB6. Mm. Uh, they just made a, a, a couple of those. And I think there may be one more shot of that. But this was Aston's, yeah, there it is. This this is Aston's glory years. They're really coming on strong. They're an esoteric brand. And uh, Steph, I think one of your heroes actually raced an Aston Martin back in the day. He sure did. So let me pull that up here. Um, was, here we go. So, yep, Carol Shelby and Roy Salvadori won the 1959 Ven Cattrall de Le Mans. Le Mans in the Aston Martin DBR1. Um, look, at, so, look at that glorious 
I mean, they, everything about that car is good looking. Uh, that's before they started the trapezoidal grill design, which started with the DB late four DB four GT that they had. Uh, but that is one handsome car. And it won. Was he at the wheel at the time? He won it. I don't remember. You know what? That's a great question. I don't remember if he came across the wheel. I mean, came across the finish line or Salvadori did. But Imagine he was on he, the team. I mean, it was he was it was one of those two. So they won. He was it. sucking down nitro pills for his angina um, mm, the yeah. whole time. And that yeah. was they, that race nearly he nearly, you know, that race nearly killed him with his heart. And that's pretty much he quit racing after that. Gotcha. Um, gotcha. Here. Well, Aston really, you know, the, to, to speed on through this history, basically you can just say that they they fought off creditors and bankruptcy uh, every few years. And David Brown did an awesome job, uh, made it till about uh, the mid mid seventies or so, and then that would have been Victor Gauntlet took over, and Victor Gauntlet was was a genius businessman, and that right there is the uh, Aston Martin. Uh, V8, that'll be an early car because they quit using wire wheels on them because the, with enough torque, you would shred the splines inside, <laughs> inside the hub. And uh, that car had the torque. And I, a lot of people say, oh, like you'll see one on Bring a Trailer and somebody go, oh, that just looks like a sort of a fancied up Mustang. Well, th th this there there's maybe a line or two in common uh i don't think they were each looking at each other when they were drawing the cars because they really and truly did some people say oh the mustang hit the market first and people say no you know uh gia drew drew that car first and so who knows and i think the the next photo shows another v8 it doesn't look i, I think it's crazy to compare the two by the way the era you're talking about is the 70s through the 80s say that again the what year the era so this would be 1970s through the 1980s. The, yes. the car didn't the car didn't change much for like 20 years. And by the way, this is my favorite era. These are my favorite Aston Martins. Same here. They just got a is it, they've got a great combination of sort of a European flair, but a very muscular look. And oh, so it's a you're, it's an English muscle car, you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah absolutely. It, it's it's like the English take on a muscle car, which is really cool. And it's super cool, and and the the hood scoop does it, and they made oh one. <laughs> Oscar India, where it was the weirdest name in the world. Oscar India really means, uh, as you guys who've been in the service, it means October introduction, OI. And that's when they introduced a lot of these options. That is the V8 designed by, heaven help me, Tadek uh, Merak. T a d e k m a r e k. Your brain is full, so and just it, it, yeah, and that one just spilled out. That's the last time I'll be able to actually remember that. But that motor lasted with that. I mean, just look that right there is just a piece of sculpture. But that's the V eight that they had, hence the name. And it's so those a are, it's, that's oh. a dual overhead cam on each side, right? That's what it's got. The it yeah. is indeed. It's a, it is a, a dual overhead cam V eight with almost that forced like induction induction system that's crazy that's it cool. is it is great looking it's just oh a my tort, gosh port monster and you know a, a very handsome car but again they were flirting with bankruptcy <laughs> basically the whole time they were making this car and then they uh eventually come out or, or they uh they, they sell to ford they yeah ford in 1987 and the v Eight Vantage, the new V8 Vantage had been designed at the time, along with a DB7, uh, which they launched. And that is, let's see, can you go? You know, DB7 is one, up one more, yeah. There you go. That's the car that when, when Ford owned Jaguar and Aston Martin, uh, they decided to combine some things. And that, that car has a, a very handsome look there. Didn't look quite as good when it, that's the prototype, didn't look quite as good when it came out, but it looked very good. But it had a Jaguar motor underneath it and sadly enough, XJS chassis. So the Jag motor was supercharged and the Aston purists hated it. And the people who bought them were called, oh, you all you did, you bought a Jag and drag. That was the joke of the day. <laughs> yeah. Sort of sadly... Uh -huh. And then that next car, I think they actually got it right. And this this may be the toward the end of the graphics here. Yeah, I that, love that. 
That's I do nice. too. That, I, I am crazy about that. And you'll see that that just sold this year for forty five and a half thousand dollars. Wow. So for people who can't see it, it's an early 2000s uh, V8 Vantage. And it's, yep. a, it's, a, it's when you think of an Aston Martin today, the design, the look, yep. it, it goes back to this car. And it's yep. just, it's one of the, to me, the ultimate iterations of a two door uh, GT coupe. Man, I don't and just. It just it, doesn't get prettier than that. It, it does not. And they're good performers. And people sometimes complain about the reliability. But, you know, in a certain price category, you just sort of have to put up with $500 water pumps. You just sort of have to get over that. And uh, this is a car that is a great performer and a, and a value, especially in a six speed. And these are, this is an Ian Callum design. He drew okay. all their cars and they, they do have a lot of family, family similarity, but for all these glorious cars, you know, folks who are listening to this or watching this, put in your comments. I mean, what do you think about them doing an SUV now? And I'd love to hear my co host take on what we just saw in the history versus the, the car spotting. Good move, bad move, or desperate move? It's all about cash. Porsche had to do it. You know, Ferrari did it. Um, Jaguar attempted it. But for, you know, they for the companies today to stay alive, they have to have an SUV in the market. And it's worth, it's their cash cow that drives the research R&D for everything else. And um, so I think they had to do the DBX. I like it. It just never caught on in this country i think there's a lot of some reliability issues and build issues and there's not a lot of dealers but it, it's i think it's great looking yeah no i echo everything i echo everything stefan said it's you know you got to do it and once you do it you got to do it right and I don't, for whatever reason i just haven't really caught on so it's funny that i i actually saw one so all right let's uh let's move on to uh the main thing i really want to or we want to talk about today and that is you know, and this is important. I'm not going to restate what I said earlier, but uh, if you're a, a 45 year old, I would say a 45 year old female radiologist or a 48 year old uh, male accountant, it doesn't really matter, or a small business owner. There's a certain vehicle every era where it's like, yeah, this says I made it. You know, you're feeling it, you're entering your career. And I wanted to go through uh, the past, not because I want to dwell on the past, but because I want to look toward the future. And this is a very important area in cars and very, very important area in automotive. And I think we need to spend some time on it. I just went through, just for perspective, what I think are the, the cool cars that that type of person would have bought 70, 1975, 1985, 1995, 2005, just kind of every 10 years. And what you'll see is it evolves. By the way, a really cool car now is any kind of Porsche. And guess what? In 20 years, it's not going to be the same. I saw an 80-ish year old woman getting into a Porsche outside of a health club, outside of a gym. And I'm like, oh my gosh, maybe that's a signal that Porsche's greatness is coming to an end. So here's my list. 1975, I said Cadillac sedan. DeVille Cadillac was the best-selling car back then. Uh, this is a sedan DeVille. This is Manhattan orange. It looks like puke orange. <laughs> no, but this car is... Life. This car was too. This is this came along when the Beetle was starting to change people's minds. They wanted smaller cars, not this right. huge monster. It does look like puke orange stuff. I agree, and people were just kind of like, Ugh, "I don't want this anymore." But that would be the car to buy in seventy five, nineteen eighty five. Totally different. This I had the. Uh, that's not the nineteen eighty five. Your picture not there. Maybe it's, I, maybe it's yeah. there. It is. There it is. There it is. There it is. Okay, yeah. yeah. So in the 80s, absolutely, the Germans were ascendant, and the 1985 BMW uh, 535, for me, was absolutely the car. And then 1995, scroll down, nope, down, other direction. Keep going. Keep going. Oh, you crap. Know. There it is. Okay. I don't know how they got all screwed up. Anyway, uh, this is the 1995 uh, Lexus LS 400. Lexus came in in the 90s. It completely changed the market. People said, I don't want German cars anymore. They, 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 they're expensive to maintain, expensive to buy. Uh, Lexus is just as nice. I'll get that instead. And then scroll up to the, the other Lexus, 2005. People started to switch to SUVs. So now all of a sudden the LX470, that's the car that uh, an accountant would buy or a radiologist or somebody cool. And then um, 2015, keep, keep going down to the SQ5. Go down, 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 down. Blue, there's it. The, wow. the, the the SQ5. So you see, it changes what people think is cool. And uh, I I, I kind of hinted at what my 25 
thing was. But guys, that's the past. What do you see as kind of the past and and you know before we get to the present and future? I mean, since I'm running the graphics here, we're gonna let we're, we'll comment on yours and then we'll switch to one of us because I can't otherwise I don't want to I can't <laughs> jump back and forth. I think that's we got to sorry. You no, know, we got to finish you out, Steve-O. So let me get stop share and I think I think this is yours. 20, 30, 35 pick right here. Uh, well, I just have 25. Oh, you Any guys, there's your 25 car. Is that yours? No, it's not mine. Oh, it's not oh. yours. All right, I'll stop. All right, anyway, all right, you don't it's have a, 25. I, I put Genesis because I think okay. that the tide is turning. Oh, there it I is. See I see okay. yeah. Genesis, the GV, it's the, it's the SUV, the GV80. I did not pick this because it's the car that almost killed Tiger Woods. I picked it <laughs> because, <laughs> true. <laughs> yeah. I picked no, it that, because, that's the car that saved his life, honestly. Yeah, yeah it right. saved his life. It All did. Right. Yes, that's the way I look at it. Hey, well, you know, you know better than we do. It's true. <laughs> so anyway, I think the Koreans are starting to become almost what Lexus was in the 90s. So yes. I think these are going to be the cars for the next 10 years or so. So that's why I picked that one. I think that's a great pick. And you know, now that I look at it, I think. I didn't put as much thought in the 2025 or because I do feel like they are ascendant. Like you said that about Lexus. I feel like that's where this car is. Exactly. I think you nailed it. That's a good pick. I tell you one interesting thing about them being so-called out of order. I think the jarring thing, anybody who was watching as we were, when you saw the, the 75 and then, you know, it was supposed to be 85, but it was actually 95. It is amazing what has happened to automobile design in 20 years. Yeah. I mean, when they went back to back, I was like, wow, that yes. happened. But still, I mean, it just shows you that the, the Cadillac made me laugh when I first saw it. But that's what you used to see back in the mid-70s. Mid that's, that's, that's what people were driving, you know. It's crazy. Yeah, it's, right. fun to, it's fun to look back. So you, you guys have any thoughts about what you thought back about those cars or those eras? You must have different different cars. But again, it's fun to look back and see how many how much it's changed yeah i right. pick you you want to go i'm gonna pull you want... yours up adam yeah. here we go all right yeah, here go we go here, here's adam's picks wow I don't, I don't know why it's great at, there there it is look look at that unit it just looks like speed uh as uh, th this is a 71 and i had to get specific on the year because you know it used to be stuff changed every year and sometimes rather dramatically but the 71 buick riviera gs 455 and I think there may be two shots of that. And it was just a it's, crazy big fat coupe. <laughs> you know, you could put that crazy Corvette esque, <laughs> you know, rear window. Like, yeah. uh, it's, but those, I remember those. Those were, those were cool. They were really cool back then. That's a great pick. They were pretty cool, but there was a lot of wasted space. Uh, I, I grew up in the back of a 1969 one of these that was even that was smaller if you can believe it. But anyway, and then for the uh, uh, the the 80s, I went with a a Ooh. 86 because in 80, 85 they had the square lights. 86 they got the bigger lights. So this is a Volvo station wagon. Listen. Yep. Uh, 245 GLT and the T is important because it's got a little turbo on it. And those wheels are really about the only way you can tell. Those are stock wheels. Uh, and I think that car had a grand total of, I put it down here somewhere, 153 horsepower out mm. of a shoulder. And that's a great one, pick, man. That is exactly, forever. yeah. That's a, that's, I mean, that's what people in the 80s were driving. That's a very good pick. And Volvo occupied its own niche in the 80s. They've sort of, you yes. know, they're kind of like blended in now, but. Uh, and in the 90s, I sort of copycat. Oh, yeah, there's just another view of the Volvo. And I would say th th we're talking about a 45 year old college professor, right? This is <laughs> <laughs> yeah. we jacket in a pipe, <laughs> and he's wearing <laughs> earth shoes. <laughs> <laughs> I, I would say this, and I, I went to college in Connecticut and went to medical school in Albany. So this would be this car, exactly this car was very Connecticut. And uh, in fact, uh, Paul Newman very famously had one of these with a Mustang five liter V8 and a five speed transmission. This was very Connecticut. Paul Newman, of course, lived in Connecticut. And he sold his friend David Letterman one on the show. Really? And he interviewed him. He, he said, yeah, I built five of them. Do you want one? And David said he was nervous and didn't know what to say. So he said, yes. <laughs> wow. I didn't know. That's cool. Yeah. Yeah. 
and there's the, the the plain Jane interior on the thing, but very safe. I think our safety editor would approve. Yes, and absolutely. Then, and then for 95, went to Ooh. the Mercedes 500E. Yeah, this uh, is the orthopedic surgeon or the neurosurgeon or yeah. the day trader. This is not the college professor. So I guess we graduated from college professor now to a really cool professional. Yeah, it got out of that and decided yeah. to go ahead and spend a little bit more of the disposable income. And that's this is when uh, Porsche and 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 uh, Mercedes had a little brief fling. That was like a person personal injury lawyer. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> there you go. But this 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 car's got little punched. If it was a BMW, it'd be called an M. Uh, but it's got little punched out fenders, bigger wheels and tires, a little bit better brakes, stiffer suspension, and the Porsche breathed on five liter V8. So that, and that's quite a collectible car these days, the 500E. Absolutely yeah, great pick. And we might see that pick again sometime, keep somewhere going. else this show. Okay. Okay. Let's see. Then in the 2000s, yeah. um, got into this is where I kind of copycatted Steve. I went a little conservative uh, with the LS430. And I tell you, one thing I dislike about this car, as opposed to one you picked, Steve, is the design is not as fresh. It's funny. I thought the original 400 was a fresher look, where this looks kind of copycat Mercedes, especially, I think there's one more view that looks like from the side. I mean, that's a yeah. 400E at the tail. Yeah. Just cover up the front. You know, that's a 400E. I, anyway, yeah. um, but a dang good car, super high quality. Hard, hard to argue with that. And then uh, let's see, what year are we in? Up to, 20s to now. Teens, the teens. Yeah. Oh, the teens, we're in the yeah. teens. Yeah, 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 yeah. So I was, um, I was still mad at uh, Porsche for, for for making the the Cayenne. So I I did the Lexus, and now I'm doing the for for the teens the uh, E55 AMG wagon, which I would take one of those right now. That's a great pick. It's a Mercedes. Yeah, but 20, 2015, excuse me. And yeah, and it's just. I love that pick. Good looking vehicle, a safe enough vehicle, a fast enough vehicle. And when I was reading the specs and I'm about, I'm not going to quote them all, but it's got a, like a zero to 60 that's comparable to a base 911. It has interior volume larger than a Cayenne, about five cubic feet larger than a Cayenne, if you can believe it. <laughs> good. And it'll still seat five people and it'll do everything you want and it'd be comfortable and safe. So, and there's what, why it's so wonderful is that AMG uh, supercharged motor. So how about 2025? Okay. Um, I, yeah. That's a separate email, Steph. I, I got it. I got it ready to go. Just, here we go. Here's your 2025 car. All right. I don't know there, why it's there it is. Yep, yep, yep. Etna Blue, um, Sport Turismo, um, Porsche. Uh, Panamera. Panamera. I can't. Yeah. You got to make it through all of them. The Panamera Sport Turismo, which I, I saw at the Porsche driving experience this last uh, weekend. It's just, it's just the greatest looking car you never see. But that's what I would get uh, just because I'd be a little bit, I don't know, more inclined to get Porsche's what I figure about their most modern car, this side of the Taycan, which I'm not going to get. I'm glad someone mentioned Porsche because they really are the hottest luxury brand now. What most people don't know when they look at the Panamera, it is on the Cayenne platform. It is a Cayenne that's been squashed. I don't, or, yeah, I, that, that's that's a Cayenne platform with with lower springs, etc. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Then, I like uh, it better. All right, Stefan. Oh, well, yeah, I think Adam's got one more here. Oh, for 2035. He's got a little picture. It looks like a little George Jetson stand-up uh, rotary <laughs> helicopter or something. It's Boeing's next project. They don't have to worry oh. about doors. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right, here we go. Oh, let me find mine. Okay. Um. Give me a second. Steve, you want to predict how many Ford seats going to have on this list? All right. Well, I got, I got one. Uh, only one. I mean, okay. I got more, it. more than one. No, more than it, one. Yeah. My, my prediction for a 2035, which I didn't say was, is, <laughs> it's like a hydrogen powered hybrid. Uh, okay. Uh, small SUV. All right. Go ahead. Stephon. All right. Here we go. You guys are ready. All right. Here we go. So Ford number one, 
No. Oh, oh man. You know, so <laughs> yeah, I love this car. This is that's a 1975 a Ling that is a Mark IV. <laughs> and um, this is just a giant car, but it's got the flip up headlights. And that to me is just, I love headlights that disappear. Now, I wouldn't get the Bill Blast edition or Givenchy <laughs> edition or the Dior one. Or there's one, a Pucci P U C C I. Yeah. Um, I would do a custom order. Easy for order. you to say. <laughs> yeah, easy for me to say. I, so that's but, what know, I when, think. When, but, but this in the Riviera and the Sinan Deville, it, it's impossible for someone like a Jeff Bank who's young to look at this and say people wanted it. These were very aspirational in the 70s. Yes, totally aspirational. You know, and, and so for me, I'd rather have a, a Lincoln Continental convertible with suicide doors from the 60s. That would be the ultimate. I think that's a Continental Mark II. So that's my 75. Now, here's here's one. My Look. 1985 car. Mm. Okay. Mm. Everybody's. Oh, so what I've got is the Bitter SC. So this was a, a kind of a boutique car out of Germany. So this is, you know, everybody's got the little Mercedes, their BMWs, their Audis. And I'm like, no, I'm, I'm going to be cool. I'm going to be a little different. I'm going for the Bitter SC. It had a uh, dual red cam inline six. And I love the design. Um, I think it's a gorgeous design of a two-door coupe. A little bit angular. And once again, it's got pop-up headlights, man. I just love that. That is a, what an interesting pick. And that car is really like, those of you who know what a Ferrari 400i looks like, that is like yeah. a little bit smaller. It is so good looking. That is an inspired choice. And that motor, Steph, you probably knew this, but the twin cam six, the bottom part of that motor, the iron part was a Chevrolet inline six that they put the twin cam head on. Really? I didn't know. I just yeah, thought they so said kind of an Opel motor. It was a uh, it was a rebadged opal. Stefan, I love this pick. By the way, no one knows what it is. There were many magazine articles about this back in the 80s. Oh, it was I was I saw this design and it's it's a little bit wedgy and and uh, it's, I just I just thought it was a cool car then and I still think it looks very cool and it is aged extremely well. It's I a agree. great car. It's a beautiful yeah. design. So that would have been and I definitely would have been cool driving that around. Hey, before you leave it, Adams, any collectability for these anymore? You know, uh, um, only in Germany. You know, it's like Germans are their own best fans, like the Japanese are their best fans, the Brits are their best fans. There's no real collectability in, in the States, but but they have a decent following overseas. It's a very, you know, it's a a, a good brand. It's considered a, a better than average, good, good brand. Uh, the Opel Diplomat was a very sexy com uh, Mercedes competitor over there, and we never saw him. So, last one sold on Bring a Trailer was eighteen for twenty six grand. Previous ones for that and seventeen sold for six grand. So you're right; wow. it's kind of it's just not. So then, Adams, you and I have very good taste. Obviously, yeah, I picked yeah. the AMG five five hundred E Hammer, and the reason is when I did my rotation surgery residency in Dayton, Ohio, Kettering Hospital. One of the orthopedic surgeons drove one of this, and I saw that thing. And you know, there, the 300E was everywhere, but he yeah. pulled up in this, and I was like, "Oh my god, that is a nasty Mercedes!" And I loved everything about it. So the hammer, a great pick, as you would expect me to say. And then 2015, you know, I, here's my Texas Cadillac. So there is a General Motors product in here, and for you, that would be a Ford, the Texas Cadillac. Um, F-150 pickup, the King's, the King Ranch version, you know, pickups were really getting big at this point in time as, a, as a people that don't need them, but started buying them. And, um, I would have probably bought this and this would have been, you know, my daily cause it's with two, three kids and well appointed, um, in, in the King's Ranch version, uh, moving, moving up a decade to 25. Mm. Uh, it's the Range Rover for me. That is the new yeah. luxury vehicle. It defines, it's replaced the S-Class Mercedes. It's replaced the 150. It's replaced the Hammer. All those cool four-door sedans. And I would have to go with the Range Rover for 2025, what this guy would be. Because that is, every time I see one of these on the road, I'm like, oh, God, it looks so cool. You know, they do. And it, it, it's it's amazing that, that they've done what every other manufacturer did is they got great money spent on designers and entire department and or floor devoted to it. Everybody's trying to, hey, what else can we do with the SUV? You know, we've done it all before. 
Range Rover makes them look better than anybody. And I don't know if people are driving around with the suspension lowered on these things, or that's just the, the normal position because it doesn't look like a jack. It doesn't look like a Escalade jacked up. It doesn't look like an Expedition jacked up. It doesn't. They these things maybe it's the, the overall design. They look lower to me. It looks like between a sedan and an SUV. I know it, it really is an SUV, yeah. very capable, but it's because the thing can jack up in the air. I don't know how many inches. Now, what I say about this, and I've, I've written about this, is that there's something about the Range Rover that provokes desire in absolutely 40, 40 ish year old blonde women in high demographic zip codes. And, uh, you know, you see a, a good looking 42 uh, year old woman in a, in a nice subdivision. Either she has one of these or wants one. Yeah. And she also has a uh, an unlimited Amex card. <laughs> All right. Well, call me what you want, uh, but I'm the guy that wants this car. (laughs) Yeah, the guys want it too. I think it's it's absolutely fantastic. So it's a great pick. And and then I would have done. I'm not done yet. I'm not. I would have done. And I would do the. I would do the mild hybrid on that. They have a mild hybrid, so all it's designed for is to recover brake energy loss. So it's not a full on hybrid. They have. So I would do that. I think that technology is where we need to go. So support that. And then. 2035, 2035, I'm hoping Lucid is around the air. I think I'm hoping to see we go back to sedans from the SUVs and the F-150s. And mm-hmm. I think this is this is the kind of sedan EV that might draw people in. Big sedan, luxurious. And so that would be my 2035 pick. If, if they're st- I think that I hope they're still around because they really did have a super nice product. They really, you know, there was one of those on the platform at Amelia Island two years ago. And of all the beautiful cars and the beautiful displays and the elaborate displays, there were as many or more people around Lucid as any other manufacturer or any other display I saw there. It's just unbelievable. Very magnetic design. Yeah, I love it. You know why I really like that answer, Stefan? And I like it a lot. I I don't think it's going to be Lucid, but it'll be something like, I think Lucid's not going to survive the year. But the reason I like it, and you know, chime in, guys. But the reason I like it is that we like big SUVs and pickups because we can see more, and you feel like you have command of the road, you're captain of the road, or whatever. In ten years, realistically, or by twenty thirty five, I think every car is going to be like the Waymo I was in. It's going to be mostly self driving or totally self driving. I think really by that time they'll be self driving. You won't need to see the road and stepping up into a big truck no longer will make sense that's, ah, that's a, a good point point. yeah i didn't think about that but you're right as we move towards autonomous driving yeah you're going to go back to more of the comfort of a sedan than a big old truck you know because the shown the, the pickup trucks with batteries don't do well i mean you know too heavy and the range is not good so That'll go on record as the first and only time I have seen an advantage to the autonomous movement. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> yeah, it's just, and, and there, there may not be windshields, there may not be a, a steering wheel. So I do think that's the way it's going to be. So it does make a lot more sense to have a, a car that's not so much tall, but longer, and you can stretch out a little bit more, get yourself more comfortable. It just makes a lot of sense. And I do think now that we're like looking at battery weight and all this BEV problems that we've talked about ad nauseum, some type of like hydrogen powered uh, hybrid system, you know, with almost no emissions, that's where we're going to be too. So it'll be self-driving hybrid kind of, uh, you know, hydrogen hybrid type thing. And I I think that kind of, I, you know, as far as brand, I did pick a brand. I, Stefan, you picked Lucid. I thought that was a good choice if they're still around. I'm going to pick my hybrid hydrogen self-driving car to be a Tesla. <laughs> How about that? Where are they going to get their hybrid other half from? Is it going to be electric hydrogen or is it going to be gas hydrogen? It's hydrogen will be the fuel and the and the hydrogen will power a generator which will power the which will charge the batteries and power the engine. Remember Tesla is a technology company. They're not an automotive ma- manufacturing company realistically. And so I don't think I don't think I don't think Tesla could pull off a hydrogen. I think what's going to happen is a solid state battery, which they've been promising, promising, promising. And I think I read something Toyota is actually hoping to have it to market. 
in five to eight years. And I think once we get to the solid state battery, I'd say it's more realistically 10 years, but the solid state battery will be the, will be the shift that um, going from dial up to fiber or, mm. or BRDs. Right. But don't you think Tesla does not need to produce or make their own hydrogen system. All they have to do is trade access to the supercharger <laughs> network for access to the hydrogen system from Hyundai or somebody. No. I'm still holding out hope for the uh, water fuel courtesy of Porsche and South America. That's true. And you're right. They could, they could expand that. I mean, it's, it's there now. Why not expand it? So, all right, well, we are out of time. We're, we're going to do the collector car, but we just have, we don't have time. We're like almost exactly two or an hour. So we'll do oh, it yes, next same. time. Okay. Teaser. $200,000 collector car next uh, next show. So, Listeners, right. viewers, tell us what you, it would be if oh, yeah. so you do 200 grand. What would be landing in your driveway? And we will surprise you with our picks next week. All right, this is fun. Close this out, man. All right, I'm going to close out by saying, hey, I've got a new website. I'm building a car. The website is called you, Nero. Uh, <laughs> I'm building a car. I'm, I'm building a... Uh, 427 Cobra, narrow hit by ERA. It's off to the body shop now to have the fenders taken off and new ones put on. But So the website is narrowhip427cobra.com. Uh, backstory, the build, the engine, and just uh, follow along. A lot of fun facts about Cobras. So uh, thanks for listening. If you're on a audio platform, if you're on YouTube, thanks for watching. Remember to hit like button, subscribe button, whatever, leave comments, and we will see you guys next week.